Well, this is the second study of the first chapter of the London Baptist Confession of 1689. And here we are going to walk through the, begin here with the second paragraph. I think we're going to get to chapter 5 today. Either 5 or 6, I don't remember where I, I broke it off. But I've kind of begun to write it and I'm breaking it off at places where it just seems appropriate. So it looks like we'll walk through the first chapter in, in three lessons, and we're doing this just as an opportunity to teach through the confession. And I know all of you have gone through the uh, 1689 class, which we have prior to uh, going through the new member class, but that really is just kind of quickly going through the confession, reading through it uh, very swiftly, talking through areas that might be controversial, just so people know, hey, this is you know what we hold to, as a church, these are doctrines that we believe are significant, and the elders have signed to this, the church officers have signed to this. So as we walk through it now, we're walking through it in more depth. I mean, if we walk through it at this pace, uh, many of you wouldn't be members at this point. You would still be in the 1689 class five years later. And so we're just going to take a little bit more time, and this is also give us an opportunity to have, you know, some of these areas of the confession taught on, because sometimes someone will have a question. And this gives us an opportunity to point to a you know, specific lesson that we taught um, in more depth. We're not in as much depth here as though you're in a seminary class. But you know, in more depth, though, where someone can look to that section and study that and hear uh, where we have actually taught on that topic. So here we are. Let's go ahead and begin with the second chapter of the London Baptist Confession. Oh, wait, the first, no. Paragraph 2, the second paragraph of the first chapter of the uh, Second London Baptist Confession of Faith. And it says, Under the name of Holy Scripture or the Word of God written are now contained the books of the Old and the New Testament, which are these. And you have the Old and New Testament, which um, you are all familiar with. I'm not going to recite them at this time. It continues to say, All of which are given by the inspiration of God to be the rule of faith and life. And we have this idea of the scriptures are inspired by God. These are God breathed. It is God has given these scriptures to us. We see Paul write of this in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. He says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete equipped for every good work. And we have there this idea of the scriptures being uh, inspired. The scriptures being that which is given to us by God. And um, I need to make an adjustment here so I can see my next slide. Sorry. Given to us, uh, given to us by God and breathed out by God. Let's continue out with with paragraph three. It says, the books commonly called Apocrypha, not being of divine inspiration, are no part of the canon or rule of scripture, and therefore are of no authority of the church, nor to be any otherwise approved or made use of than other human writings. And you have here a statement made on what's known as the Apocrypha. And so if any of you have come from a Roman Catholic background, you probably realized when you went into a Protestant church and you opened up the Bible that there were some books that weren't there. There's some books that were you were used to seeing. Where is First and Second Maccabees? You know, where's Bell and the Dragon? Where are some of these books that I'm used to seeing in my Bible and they're not here? And so Protestants do not hold the Apocrypha to the same level as Scripture. And it's important to to kind of see where the confession falls down on this. Um, the, uh, the confession does not say that the Apocrypha is of no use at all. The Apocrypha doesn't say that using the Apocrypha at any time is always sinful and always wrong. It doesn't make that statement at all. Um, rather, what it does is it puts it on the same level as any other human writing and there is parts of the Apocrypha that you can, I have found to be useful, and I've mentioned this before, but I found 
uh, in seminary when I was I had to read through it and I had to uh, write a paper on it and uh, I found first and second Maccabees to be very helpful I found it to be very I was very insightful and I almost think that the writers of the New Testament kind of expected you to have some of the understanding that you know you would get from those two those two books because it kind of gives you a setting of where things are and how things got to be where they are because when you walk into the new testament you just see these pharisees and here's the pharisees and when you think of the pharisees let's be honest you think of the bad guys right those are the guys that are against jesus those are the bad guys and uh, those are the self-righteous ones and when you read books like first and second maccabees you don't see them in that way you see them as the people that were kind of the everyman's theologian, the common person, and the one who was standing up against the empire and leading people to trust in God. And so it gives you a better perspective there in understanding when Jesus says something like, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. And for many of us, we might say, well, of course not. They're just self-righteous hypocrites. See how they pray? Okay, well, you have a little more insight than, you know, some of the people at the time when he said that did. And when they heard that, that was terrifying. It's like, wait a second. Those are the holiest people we know of. And so there are ways in which some of these can be helpful. Um, You're never going to see us use any of these in our liturgy. Um, You're almost never going to see us quote from them. Protestants tend not to. Um, that said, that's a little bit of an overstatement. Uh, the Church of England will use it sometimes. I believe Lutherans will at times use it in their liturgy. Um, Presbyterians, never, as far as I know. Baptists, I don't know of any that, that ever use it uh, in liturgy. Um, and so the, the way we usually talk about this as, as Protestants is we say, well, the Apocrypha came about because, you know, during the Reformation, there was a Counter-Reformation, and you had uh, Jesuits and others and those at the Council of Trent, and they brought forward all of these texts and said they're the same as Scripture. And just right then in the middle of the Reformation, these were brought forward. There's some truth to that, and there's in some ways that that's not exactly true, because the debate over the Apocrypha had been going on for some time. And believe it or not, Augustine is one that held them uh, very highly, uh, almost held them to the same level as Scripture. It's hard to know sometimes exactly what Augustine is saying at times. Uh, Sometimes it's a matter of which Augustine you're reading. You find that with Luther as well. Which Luther am I reading at this time? Um, And um, Jerome was one that kind of came on the other side and did not recognize him. So you had this debate going on in church history regarding uh, these texts, the church overwhelmingly accepted uh, the 66 books that we know of as the Bible, and the Apocrypha is that which was um, of debate. Let's just look at a few other other areas. I could spend more time on that, but I don't want to spend too much time. But just to give a little background on the Apocrypha, since the you know the scriptures do mention this, and they mention it very specifically because it was something of controversy at this time. The Roman Catholics were pushing forward these other texts. Um, And there are silly superstitious ideas that have been put forward, I mean, such as, you know, well, we know these are the scriptures here because at the Council of Nicaea, they put them on the table, and then by divine intervention, only those scriptures stayed upon the table, and there's many other silly superstitions that were given about the Council of Nicaea. I'm sure many of you remember the story of St. Nicholas, and he, the, the true story was he was in a debate with Arius, and he ended up hitting Arius, punched him over, a, uh, over the doc- deity of Christ. He ended up going into prison, and then there's this superstitious story there that supposedly he was given his robes back, and Mary brought him, um, you know, everything, and so it was demonstrated that he was one who should continue to serve. And this is, these are silly ideas. This isn't how we come up with doctrine. This isn't how we decide what is the word of God, and I really appreciate where this lesson ends, ends, because this lesson ends with us talking about you know what makes something the Word of God, and the framers of the Confession did a very good job of including language in here, which discusses what makes something the Word of God. Why is it the Word of God? Let's let's look um, just at a. At a a couple other writings. Let's look at 39 articles. This comes from the Church of England. This is their 
their writing on this, um, where they speak of the Apocrypha and the 39 Articles. In Article 6, it says, And the other books, as Jerome saith, the church doth read, for example, of life and instruction, of manners, but yet doth not, uh, doth it not apply them to establish any doctrine. And so you see there the allowance for it to be used kind of in liturgy, in church services. Belgic Confession says this, The church may certainly read these books and learn from them as far as they agree with the canonical, uh, canonical books, but they do not have such power and virtue that one could uh, confirm from their testimony any point of faith or of the Christian religion, much less can they, be, can they detract from the authority of the other holy books. And the Westminster Confession, um, pretty much the same wording, says the books commonly called Apocrypha, not being of divine inspiration, are no part of the canon of Scripture and therefore are no authority in the church of God nor to be any otherwise approved or made use of than other human writings. And so you have very similar language there uh, that is used in the Westminster, and that's the line that we came from. Westminster, as we have said before, affected the Savoy. The Savoy then influenced us in the um, London Baptist Confession of 1689. Let's move on to to paragraph 4 of of the confession, and this is kind of regarding scripture at this point. It says, the authority of the Holy Scripture for which it ought to be believed depends not upon the testimony of any man or church, but wholly upon God, who is truth itself, the author thereof. Therefore, it is to be received because it is the word of God. The word of God is to be received because it is the word of God. And that is where they're going to spend the next couple paragraphs at. That that is what makes something the Word of God. The fact that it is the Word of God, it was revealed by God, it was God-breathed. That's its basis. Second Peter, this is also where you will find uh, Jesus standing, you will find the apostles standing here. You don't see them walking down, you know, evidence that deserves a verdict and trying to prove that the word of God is the word of God. They stand upon the word of God being the word of God. And many have gotten into a lot of trouble in these areas because people begin to, you know, let me dissect this book. Well, you know, maybe Deuteronomy is one that we can't be sure of. And so maybe, you know, it's not one that we can be certain is the word of God. But then you find Christ speaking from the book of Deuteronomy so many times. Uh, there's a professor named Peter Inns that got himself in trouble a while back, and he was teaching at Westminster, and he uh, had written some good commentaries. His commentary on Exodus was, was a fantastic commentary. I was blessed by it. But he is one who began to get into you know, historical critical uh, scholarship and began to really question the authority of whole parts of the Old Testament to the point where he was... Um, didn't even believe that Moses had written parts of the Pentateuch, believed it had been written by, they have, I'm not going to go into the, their different theories, but they believe that, you know, part of it was written by priests and part of it was written by Levites and part of it was written by Moses and you have these different views of where it came from and they think they can put it in a computer and make such determinations. And he ended up getting pressed at one point and, you know, he said, well, what about what Moses said here? Did did Moses say that? And he's like, no, I don't think so. He said, but Jesus said Moses said that. And he said, well, I think Jesus was wrong. <laughs> that puts you in a very interesting place. He's not at Westminster Theological Seminary anymore. You can't be at a conservative theological seminary and believe that Jesus is ignorant over who authored the Old Testament. He can't be the son of God. He can't be wrong about that. There's a problem in your theology uh, that is there, and people get themselves into great, great problems when they allow worldliness to begin to affect them in these areas. And here's what you've got to understand, that these things go through cycles, and you will have in academia one particular cycle now where they're focused upon, and then a generation goes by, and then there's something else that the liberals are focused on, and then a generation goes by, and there's something else the liberals are going to be uh, focused upon. But the word of God continues to be the word of God. Let's look at what Peter says. Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 19, he says, And we have the prophetic word more confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention as a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing that this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. 
for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And there's a declaration there as to what makes something the word of God. God declared his word to us. And it wasn't given to someone, as many cult leaders describe it, where they were just given these exact words and they began to dictate them. There's very few times where you see that method used in the scriptures. You have God sovereignly, providentially using someone's life, using their experiences, using their education, and the Holy Spirit working within them, and then them writing what they, what they write. And you see, even obviously you see authors' personalities in what they are writing, but that doesn't take away from it being uh, the word of God. And it's not from the will of man, it's from the will of God, and it is distinct. But what makes something the word of God? How is it something is the word of God? How are we to respond to something being the word of God? Let's look at paragraph five there. And it says this, we may be moved and induced by the testimony of the church of God to high and reverent esteem of the holy scriptures and heavenliness of the matter, the efficacy of the doctrine, the majesty of the style, the consent of all parts, the scope of the whole, which is to give glory to God, the full discovery of it that it makes of the only way of man's salvation and many other incomparable excellencies and entire perfections thereof. Our arguments whereby it does abundantly evidence itself to be the word of God, yet notwithstanding our full persuasion and assurance of the infallible truth and divine authority thereof is from the inward work of the Holy Spirit bearing witness and with the word in our hearts. I have a few ideas that I want to uh, kind of spend just a bit of time here in paragraph 5 because I think there's, there's some new ideas that are being brought forward that I want us to just really think upon. You have here brought forward the idea of the illumination of the Holy Spirit. And we left off last time in our last study in talking about cessationism. All right? And that is the idea, that is the doctrine, that is the belief that the Holy Spirit is not working in the life of the church in the same way the Holy Spirit was working uh, during the times of the apostles, whereby you had people who had gifts of healing. You had times where someone's shadow was healing someone. You had times where people had the ability to speak an utterance from God, and God was giving that to them. And these were special. These were um, times in the church where the canon of Scripture was, in all reality, still being put together, still being completed. It wasn't a canon yet. The fact that we, we talked about that last time, the fact that it is a canon means that it's complete. There's nothing more that you can add to it. And we left there. And sometimes people like to make a caricature of Reformed Christians. They like to look at them and say, well, you know, oh, we still believe the Holy Spirit works. I've had charismatic friends that will say things like that in jest. Well, we still believe in the Holy Spirit. We think the Holy Spirit's still alive and well today. And they always have to say it like that, kind of clench their fist and drive it upward like, they're, like their team just scored a touchdown as though we're like, oh, yeah, well, okay. That's not at all um, the idea of what Reformed Christians believe. In fact, many of these that hold to these ideas that, you know, you still have these prophetic gifts being practiced, that you still have these gifts of healing being practiced, that they're not. Like if you had the gift of healing, why don't you go into the hospital, begin to heal people. It, it, it's just not something that happens where people just walk up, you know, with a cane and then you, you hit them and, or you push on someone and say, okay, don't take your insulin anymore. This is not, that's not how this worked. These were very clear healings that happened. These were people that were destitute, begging for the entirety of their life, and now they're standing and they're walking. These are people that were blind, and now they're able to see. These are people that are dead, and now they're alive. That's not happening now. And it's okay. okay? You don't need to feel bad. You don't need to feel like less of a Christian because that's not happening right now. What makes it so significant during that time is that that's not the way things normally operated. That wasn't how things normally worked. 
All right, it's pointing back to the time of Elijah and Elisha when these great miracles were happening. And that's what we're seeing there in the work of Christ, seeing there uh, through the work of the apostles. But this is not the way things are always going to happen. These were sign gifts. I'm not going to go back into that. We spent time in that last time. But we as Reformed Christians do not have a view that the, the Holy Spirit is boring and he's just not doing anything anymore. And these other Christians have all this excitement. It's actually, I think, just the very opposite. And this is this idea that is being communicated here. That the Holy Spirit is alive and well. He is working and he is illuminating truths to people. He is bringing them to an understanding of these ideas. And although last time we talked about the fact that these revelatory gifts where God is revealing special revelation to people, we don't believe God is still doing this because we have his word and he's revealing himself now through his word. But the Holy Spirit is working there. He is revealing that which has been revealed. He's just not, he's not revealing new revelation. He's revealing what has already been revealed. Let me show you just an example of this in the scriptures. Galatians chapter 1, beginning in verse 14, Paul says, And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age, among many people, so extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. You see what we have there. You have the Lord revealing Christ to him, revealing that which has already been revealed, revealing truth that he was blind to before. He was persecuting Christ prior to that. He was seeking to destroy those who believed upon Christ, and it became revealed to him who Christ was, what Christ had done. Well, that's what the Holy Spirit does. See, the Holy Spirit is revealing that which has been revealed now. Yeah, it is sad that we have such a low view of Scripture, dear friends. It is so sad that, 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 that people will have such a low view of a pastor who spends all week studying the Scriptures, trying to understand what they say, trying to think of how best to apply them and proclaim them to a congregation. And that's kind of old and, and boring. Old script. We want something new, right? We want something that's going to be fresh and refreshing to us. And then someone can just stand up and say, well, God just told me this. Well, they're going to want to listen to that. Why do, you, why do we not see this? That, that the Spirit is working in revealing his word to someone. The Spirit is working in your life. And that person revealing this truth to you, that there is, there, there is much respect that should be had for that. God just giving something new to say out of the clear blue is not even normally how this, these things occur. It isn't normally how that happens. It's very few times in Scripture do you even see it happening in that way. We have many of these writings that we have. We have letters that this apostle is writing to this church over here, not just to, oh, I'm suddenly given this exact message and I'm writing it down verbatim. Not generally how that was happening. The Holy Spirit is alive. And, and why is that so? Why is this illumination so important? Why is it necessary? Why do we need the Holy Spirit to be active and alive and well in this world and in the church? Well, Paul tells us, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning in verse 14, it says, The natural man does not accept the things of God. Or rather, the natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. If you are not awakened, if the Spirit does not open your eyes, if he does not give you understanding to the truth of God, you will not accept the truth of God. The Spirit must work in your life. And you must not see that as something that is small, as something that is boring. That is something that is of great significance. That is someone who was spiritually dead, who has been made alive. That is, that is a great 
great and incredible act that the Spirit does. And the Spirit continues to work and to illuminate the truth, the Word of God, to the people of God. The Spirit of God that is within you, that is dwelling within you if you are in Christ. Brings you to understanding, gives you greater understanding, even of the Word of God. Things that you had read before, that you had heard before, that you later come to a greater understanding of. That's the Spirit working in your life. Apart from the work of the Spirit, you would not have such understanding. There would be not such changes in your life during those times. Let's spend this last part here kind of talking about these evidences for the Word of God that the confession brings forward. And I, I really appreciate the wording that they used here. And I, when I read through this, I really sat on paragraph 5 for quite a while, and I appreciated uh, the arguments that they're making here because they're arguments that are still needing to be made right now. It's important that we understand what makes something the Word of God. And when you speak to other people that perhaps don't believe the Bible is the Word of God, you need to speak to them in this way. Don't speak to them as though these evidences make something the Word of God, or it just has to be the Word of God. It is the Word of God because it is the Word of God. That's what makes it the Word of God. Let's look at some of the evidences that they mention here. You see the evidence of church history. I mean, if it is the Word of God, we should not be surprised that there are great and incredible evidences that point to it being the Word of God. And these are evidences that I would argue you're not going to find in other religious writings in this same way. So there are great distinctions that are here. And there's, 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 there's purposes and there's times and places for evidences, but they need to be used in the right way. Uh, we need to not give up our foundation when we use evidence. But they, they point here to church history. It says, we may be moved and induced by the testimony of the church of God to the high and reverent esteem of the holy scriptures and the heavenliness of the matter. The Bible was accepted by the church early on. It wasn't, you know, just at the Council of Nicaea. It's not what Dan Brown says where, okay, a bunch of men in power just got together and, and just made this the scriptures and disregarded the Gospel of Thomas. That's absolute foolishness. The Gospel of Thomas wasn't anywhere near uh, being written at that time, and the Gospel of Thomas um, very much contradicts the Word of God. It is a Gnostic writing. It's very clearly Gnostic in its writing. It's, you know, that kind of theology is something that um, John was, was fighting against in First John. Maybe not full-blown Gnosticism, but those early Gnostics. The Bible was accepted by the church early on. It's in the first few centuries that we see it being accepted, seeing it being utilized. You see later on in these councils them accepting what has already been accepted. And there's many people. One of the other evidences that you see is that people were so willing to give their lives for these documents, so willing to preserve them, and they weren't willing to preserve other human documents in the same way. There was a very special relationship that the church had with uh, the scriptures. And that is an evidence that you can look to uh, for the word of God and see that it buttresses this idea, supports this idea that this is the word of God. Next point they bring out is the systematic theology, the richness of the doctrine. It says the efficacy of the doctrine. There is greatness in the doctrines that you have in the scriptures. It, it is incredibly systematic. Covenantally and covenant theology, you see the ways in which there is a grand picture here. There is a great story that is being told from beginning to end. It is the same story that is being told throughout the scriptures with different people in different times, in different situations. And it points to evidence of it being the word of God, this, this systematic um, doctrine that is in there, the flow of that throughout it, and the consistency that is there. It's literary beauty. There's great literary beauty, especially when you begin to understand the languages and see how it flows together. But even in English, there is much that is there that is, um, as it says here, of majesty and style. I was impressed by Rosaria Butterfield. When she was, she was talking, I, I, many of you have probably read her book, um, Confessions of a Secret Thoughts of an Unlikely Convert, I, th I believe is the name. And she, it was a, um, she was not a Christian. 
She was an Ivy League type professor. She, um, she was a homosexual. Uh, she is one who was a, a strong modern feminist and very much stood against the, you know, the doctrines of Scripture, did not hold to Christianity. Well, she was influenced by a minister in the OPC church and his wife, and they began to befriend her, and they began to invite her into their home, and they began to speak to her, and they began to really break down some of her prejudices. She really thought Christians were these, you know, just fundamentalist and, and were scared of everything in the world and wouldn't interact with other people. Just thought of the, you know, the Bible as just being, you know, some kind of a backwoods book. And she, as a literary professor, began to engage with the Bible, began to read it and was awestruck at just the, the depth of literary style, at the greatness of the writing. This, this wasn't written by a bunch of uneducated backwoods people. There is uh, great style that was there. Uh, there's great depth. That's something that amazed me. Uh, I, I, when I first began to read the Bible, I, I figured that it was going to be a bunch of laws, and I didn't really think there was going to be great depth of thought. And I was amazed when I began to read through the book of Ecclesiastes, and I saw the, the depth of philosophical thought that was there and, and the many things that I had thought in my life and been contemplating in my life were dealt with right there in that, that book in very sophisticated ways, in very deep ways. The, the Bible is, as it says here, has great majesty and style, has, has great depth. Um, consistency in writing is the next part they bring out, the constant of all the parts. There's great consistency that is within the scriptures. It's not contradictory. It's consistent in our, all parts. There are no other religious texts that are like this. You will find them contradicting themselves on the same page. And you have the scriptures written over a time that spans over 1,500 years on three different continents. Three different languages are contained within the scriptures. Forty different authors. People that lived in, in different time periods. People that come from different backgrounds. It never is just one guy that just says, okay, I've, you know... I've got these manuscripts I dug up, or, oh, I just got this revelation right here, write it down. It never is like that. So many different people from so many different backgrounds, historically grounded. You don't see that in other religious texts. It's just, oh, well, you know, over in the Americas, you have them, and they were making things out of iron and making things out of brass and making things out of glass, and then the historians begin to read that, and they say, wait a minute. Where are all these cities that were over here? Where are all these wars that were happening? Who was making glass over here? Who was making these, these, these instruments of war at the times over here? And you see no, so, no such evidence of such things. That, of course, would come from the teachings of, of Mormonism. But it's been time and time again where, although you may not have evidence in archaeology, for everything that is in the scriptures, you don't have contradictory archaeology. Pontius Pilate is one of those areas that for many years, oh, they mocked Christians. There never was a Pontius Pilate. You just, just made this up. But you must remember that we have manuscripts of this very close to the time when these things occurred. And you have people giving their lives for these manuscripts to continue to preserve them and allow them to continue You'd have to be a crazy person to be giving your life for what you know to be a lie. Certainly people die for what is a lie. But when you're right there near that time period, they, they were speaking of things that were happening at that time and naming specific historical figures. And wouldn't you know it, in digging up around that area, they ended up finding someone whose name was Pontius Pilate. He was someone who did not last very long. That's why he wasn't well known. Well, things kind of fell apart under his rule. And so he was removed. He didn't continue to get to rule. Um, and there's been many, many stories like this. Uh, Dead Sea Scrolls are another example of that, where some used to mock and say, look, you don't have these manuscripts, you don't know that. And sure enough, a little shepherd boy throwing rocks into a cave breaks a uh, clay pot. There they are. These manuscripts that the church has been holding to for all of these years and cannot be 
cannot be argued against. The Gospel of John is another one. There's so many that argue, no, no, this must have been written later on. This must have been written into the 3rd and to the 4th century by someone else. But oh, what do they find? Something from the 1st century. A piece of it that is there. Now, that, so much for that argument. And as I say, liberals will begin to have an argument, and then an evidence will come forward, and they will go and try to find another argument. Evidence isn't ultimately what solves this. Consistency of writing. It's constant in all parts. It's very consistent, not contradictory. Continues, the scope of the whole which gives all glory to God. God was sovereign over his word. God was sovereign over what he gave to us. Soteriological significance. I don't know if that's a word, but I'm going to use it. Soteriological significance. So that's the next evidence that they give to us. The full discovery it makes of the only way of man's salvation. You have no other means that have been given whereby man can be saved. What is the greatest evidence of the scriptures? They give the only means whereby sin is dealt with. No other religion deals with sin. It either gets just pushed along, ignored, not really dealt with. So you have a God that's inconsistent, not really a just God. Maybe he'll be real hard on this person, and then he'll be real lenient on this person. You have in the scriptures the only means that has been given. That's no small thing. That's a great, great evidence that we have there. No other religion deals with sin in the way that Christianity deals with sin. God is both just and justifier in the scriptures. Soteriological significance. And then continuing on, it... um, It says, in many other incomparable excellencies and entire perfections thereof. Um, So, it continues. And are arguments whereby it does abundantly evidence itself to be the word of God. Each of these points gives evidence that the Bible is the word of God. Each of these points gives significant argument as to why why it's the word of God. But none of these are the reasons why it is the word of God. That's a very important, you may think, well, you're just splitting hairs there. They wrote this in this way for a very good reason. These don't make it the word of God. It has these things because it is the word of God. The church is going to cling to it as the word of God because it is the word of God. Because it's the word of God, it's going to have this soteriological significance. It's going to have this internal consistency. It's going to have this beauty and majesty in the way it's written. Should we not be surprised that there's literary beauty in the scriptures? You just merely need to look at the creation that the Lord has made. Merely look at the sunset. Merely look at that which is around you. There's great beauty that is there. Should we not be surprised that there is beauty within the Word of God? There is depth. There is complexity. The Word of God is something that you can read your entire life and continue to gain a greater and a greater knowledge. That's something I found in the Gospel of John. There are themes that are there that are flowing so tightly through there that some of them I didn't begin to see until I was getting to the end of the gospel. If I were to preach through the gospel of John again, there would be things that I would say that I, that I didn't say the first time that I preached through it. There's so many levels of depth there within that great gospel, and that is the word of God. The, the word of God has great depth. It has great beauty. They come down on this point. This is very important, and I... This is why I want to emphasize this. They say, yet notwithstanding our full persuasion and assurance of the infallible truth and divine authority thereof is from the inward work of the Holy Spirit bearing witness by and with the word of God in our hearts. So all of these, all of these points that have been mentioned are legitimate, are real, are, are no small thing, are not something that we need to dismiss. We need to recognize these. We need to uphold these. We can even speak these truths to someone if they begin to question. But ultimately, the recognition of something being the word of God, the recognition of the word of God, comes about through the work of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit revealing that to someone, causing that person to recognize, trust, 
and believe upon the Word of God rather than dismiss it, rather than treating it as refuse, rather than treating it as trash. Well, the Lord has to bless this. And important, approaching the Word of God as though it is the Word of God, not as though I get to approach this and I get to just decide, well, what, what do I accept and what do I not accept? Let me just go through here. Let me just, I'll take this and I don't want this and I really like this and I really don't like these sins, so I'm going to emphasize those. And these ones over here, well, I don't know. Paul was having a bad day when he wrote that one, maybe. That was maybe just his opinion over here. Not so. Not, that's not rightly accepting uh, the Word of God. The Word of God is the Word of God because God has declared it. It is God breathed. That's what makes it the Word of God. And it's for that reason that it should be believed. It's for that reason it should be trusted in. It's for that reason that it should be held in the highest authority. As we will continue to see, we'll begin to walk through um, how we're to interact with the Word of God in the next lesson. How are we to understand the Word of God and deal with the Word of God. But this is an important foundation to have. Because if we can get this right, if we can understand that this is the Word of God, if we can understand that God has breathed this, God has given this to us, he has declared it to us, that we must recognize that it's not a matter of our opinion. And that's going to be something that affects us in many great ways in how we interact it, with it and how we interpret it and how we apply it and how we, how we use it. So I pray God would bless our next study as we begin to uh, walk through this area of understanding how it is we are to interact now with the Word of God since we know it to be the Word of God. We believe it to be the Word of God. We decided this is the Word of God. What does it mean to be the Word of God? Next, we're going to talk about how do we interact with that which is the Word of God. Um, let me go ahead and pray.